welcome to yet another edition of Top Shot, a program which is becoming of interest to people because in this program we talk to people on various issues concerning you and me. Today we are very fortunate to have a very well-known, distinguished leader of the farmer, Mr. Sharad Joshi, who also is a member of parliament and very happy to receive you. Welcome, Mr. Sharad Thank Joshi, you, Suresh. We have met so often and talked so often, but I am lucky to have you to be interviewing me on subjects that concern agriculture. Yeah, because, you know, I think, uh, don't you agree that there is no other subject more important than agriculture in India today? It ought not to be. I, that should have been the position all these years. Unfortunately, the powers that be took different views at different times. For example, immediately after independence, while some of the fertile states went to Pakistan, and we had a situation of food shortage. Some of the representatives of Pandit Jawala Nehru went to the United States and found that the world food grain market was extremely buoyant. You could ask for any quantity of food at any price and the governments were prepared to give it to you practically even without charging any money. Oh. That gave an impression in the early years that uh, Indian agriculture can stand benign neglect. That's exactly the quotation from Ashok Mehta. And because of that, the uh, first government deliberately started twisting the terms of trade in favor of industry, made the public sector the centerpiece of the Indian economy, and rather than accepting the village as the unit of planning, as Gandhi would have liked it, we deliberately made the cities and the industry as the focal point. That's where we probably went off the track. Had it not been for that, for example, in 1950s, if the United States was not flush with food grains, the then, then government would have possibly started giving better attention to agriculture. Yeah. Now, not that they did not give attention at all. In the first five-year plan, for example, there were a number of important dams like Bhagwan Anga yeah. that were built. But that was an infrastructural build-up. Yes, Some effort was also made to build up the organizational infrastructure, like for example, the cooperative institutions. But the important determinant of agriculture production is neither infrastructure nor technology. It is the willingness of the farmers to put in effort and investment and increase the production. Unfortunately, it was this economic incentive part which got neglected right up to 1965. So actually, uh, after the Green Revolution really started, we were uh, shaken from our slumber. Not after the Green Revolution started, sometime before that, because the way United States supplied PL-480 food grains to most of the poor countries, in the United States itself, an idea developed that food grain was an important weapon. If they were feeding the third world countries so abundantly, then that a person like Jawaharlal Nehru should deviate from their normal foreign policy line and try to claim to be neutral was something of an anathema to them. And little by little they moved to a position where they tried to get India to fall in line with the American policy by altering its policies particularly towards Pakistan. At about the same time, since Pakistan started making threatening noises, India was caught in a whammy and they had to do something to reduce their dependence on the shiploads of food grains that were coming here. That is where we had some courageous leadership like Lal Bahadur Shastri, C. Subramanyam, who took the risk of getting a few bags of uh, high yielding variety seeds distributing it in Punjab, getting it multiplied and starting with the experiment of the Green uh, Revolution. The Green Revolution technology essentially depends on high yielding variety seeds which respond even better 
with uh, good doses of fertilizers yeah. and protected by pesticides. Yeah. That's besides that basically the green revolution technology. And in fact, uh, that was the famous slogan of Lal Bahadur Shastri of Jai Jawan and Jai Kisan to make sure that we become self-reliant while protecting our borders externally, but we also must be really self-reliant and yeah. try to be self-reliant in food. He was policy. certainly the first prime minister to bestow that honor on the Kisans. Yeah. I think that <laughs> really the prestige of Kisan was raised at that particular time. But you know, talking about uh, 91, when everybody says that we embarked upon a huge new economic thinking, a paradigm shift, uh, again that particular time, like China started their economic reforms in 78, freeing agriculture from several controls. Mm -hmm. But in India, we never thought of uh, freeing agriculture at all, till uh, we are now forced to do something because farmers are committing suicide and becoming a forced big political problem. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, was it a mistake that in 91 we should, did not, we just thought about li de-licensing in industry, opening up uh, some sectors of economy, but not agriculture? Well, it was a grievous mistake looking in hindsight. But at that particular time, even economic reforms generally meant breaking down the license permit quota control laws, relaxing the restrictions on opening of new industries and relaxing to some extent the entry of FIIs and FDIs. Beyond that, I don't think even Dr. Manmohan Singh was really aware of the fact that agriculture needs some reforms. Because I remember at that time we had invited him to a seminar in Pune. And when we put forward this case, the maximum that he could say was, that's true, that we have not done anything for agriculture even after 1991. I know, but now, you know, even now, for example, uh, we had a big, big package of 60,000 crores as a write-off for the farmers. That was a welcome measure because farmers are in any case in big debt. But unless we actually make agriculture a commercially viable enterprise, these type of measures, would it lead to real long-term sustainability of agriculture or these are the only few measures which might satisfy few farmers at particular time but will not address the real fundamental problem? Suresh, I wish we had you in the cabinet because agricultural indebtedness is an integral phenomenon. Small farmers and big farmers are both running their agricultural vocation at a loss. Yeah. This was observed by C. Subramanian. Yeah. And the reason why all of them are running their agriculture at a loss was also established when the uh, Uruguay round of talks was going on yeah. in WTO. While well, all developed countries like Japan, Europe and America were giving their farmers billions of dollars by way of subsidies. Indian government had to ad admit that in India we had a policy where if the farmer's cost of production was of over 180, he would not get more than 100 rupees. That's something that was uh, really scandalous. But that's a fact it's documented. Now if at that time we had started the uh, reforms in agriculture or even earlier when Nehru tried the amazing thing of collectivizing agriculture yeah. that was really the time when we should have started just about yeah. seven or eight years before China if we had started a poor agricultural tilt to our policies then we would have certainly avoided many of the tragedies which we had to face later on. Yeah, in fact, uh, even today I see, unfortunately, though everybody, almost all political parties, almost all same thinking people have welcomed the right off. But it should be a part of a major, not the only major that should have been taken. But again, talking about it, you know, this looks like in India particularly, anywhere in the world, we have to provide minimum price to the farmers because of so much of uncertainty, factors going beyond the farmers like weather on which he has no control. And particularly in the time of climate change, of course, that's become the major factor. But how can you have a maximum price? In fact, maximum price should never be there. Farmers should be allowed to sell products in a marketplace, try to realize as much as he can. If the government wants to buy, government should say, okay, at open price, you can come and buy. But minimum price, I'll put it. In India, we have got exactly the other way around. The minimum price has become virtually like a maximum price. Maximum price. So how do we actually get out of this? The... One correction that I would like to suggest, and I have just come back from uh, Vidarva, Yavatmar and Amravati. 
that farmers at large are entirely dissatisfied with this package. Okay. The only people who can be said to be relatively happy or at least showing to be happy are some few organizations, non-governmental organizations and even political parties who tried to jump into the fray at the last moment having some kind of a prescience that in this budget there will be something for the farmers and that they will be able to claim a part of the credit for that. But farmers are at large are extremely unhappy about it for various reasons. Number one, agricultural indebtedness is a integral phenomenon. Small farmers run their agriculture at a loss so do large farmers. Farmers buy, farmers borrow money from banks and in order to be able to repay the banks, they go to the money lender, take money from the money lender and give it to the bank. Yeah. At any given point of time, whether a farmer owes money to the bank or to the money lender is entirely a matter of accident. Yeah. Under these circumstances, the those in power who are supposed to be knowledgeable should I try to make a distinction between the banks and the money lenders is really unfortunate. Secondly, if the small farmer is running in a loss, then why should any distinction have been made between the small and the big farmer? Yeah. Similarly, why should they have exempted or uh, given relief in respect of crop loans, short term loans? but not long-term loans. Yes. It only shows that somebody either was uh, naive or somebody was deliberately trying to play mischief. Yes. I'm using this word very seriously because when I was in Vidarbha recently, the general opinion was that this scheme has benefited the sugarcane growers, the grape growers, and similarly crop uh, value crop producers of Western Maharashtra, while the farmers in Vidarbha have practically not got any benefit of that, for historical reasons, Vidarbha has been a landlord or Jamindavi or Izardavi area, where 12 to 15 acres is a normal size of holding. But if in those 12 or 15 acres they are not able to get any profit and therefore not able to repay the loans, then the question is, was it deliberately twisted yeah. to suit the Western Mahavata? Similarly, another point. In Vidarva, the money lender is not the Shedji Bhaji type as you see in Western Mahavata. He is typically a provision stores owner in the village or he might be running an agro service center or a cloth shop. The normal practice of the farmers is whenever they need they go to the provision shop, they go to the cloth shop or to the agro-safe service center, take things on credit and the understanding is that whenever in the year they sell the crop, they will return the money. Now this particular money lender is unlike the, the Shedji Bhaji money lender of Western Maharashtra, and there is nothing like a caste element involved in the money lender in Bidarbha. If you say that this money lender should not be repaid even one paisa or he should be driven away, then all that has happened is that the provision stores man is now not giving on credit yeah. even the normal day-to-day -day requirements to the farmer. So he's worse off than before the it's farmer. Worse, that's why you, have, you will find that the suicides have not stopped. The Thank suicides you. actually continue. On the holy day, there were six farmers who committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I was in Amravati on the 29th and three farmers committed suicide in Amravati on that very day. Oh. So what has happened is the uh, people who had leftist notions about what agricultural problem is because they have never believed that the problem is marketist. They have always thought that the problem is essentially between the small landholders and the big landholders. Yeah. And they have always tried to divide the village community into the small and the big, which is really not the case. And so to conclude about the uh, loan waiver scheme, I think there is going to be a very major uprising of farmers in some days to come. Another reason, 
when you waive off the loans, give loan waiver or uh, uh, give some kind of concessions, then the minimum that is expected, and as you mentioned it, Suresh, it should not become necessary for the government to repeat this every three or five years. Now that can happen only if the government does not deliberately depress the agriculture yes, prices. Yes. Now let's see what P. Chidambam has done. In last year's budget, because some of his left friends told him that the commodity exchanges are resulting in increasing prices, yes. he banned taking open positions in paddy and wheat yes. last year itself. Yes. In fact, the Abhijit Sen committee that was appointed has found no evidence of that type and therefore we were really expecting that these bans on the market will be removed and this year for the first time we will not have to make the same mistake that we made about wheat last year. On the contrary, what Chidamba has done, he has imposed a commodity transaction tax of 17 rupees per 1 lakh, which is a very big sum. Yeah. Formally, 1 lakh is a typical transaction. Formerly, if he had to pay 3 rupees per transaction, now he has to pay something like 20 rupees per transaction. Now what's going to happen is, you are going to practically kill the commodity yes. market. Yes. Why are we going to kill the commodity market? Because the Abhijit Sen committee that was appointed and which was expected the, to give recommendations that will support the banning of the market is not doing anything of the kind. So we didn't even wait for the report to come out. And we are closing every important uh, avenue that the farmers were hoping for in this particular budget. I'll mention one point. Commodity markets, unlike what most communists or leftists believe, is not a gambler's market. Yeah. This is an entirely misconceived notion. It's like stock markets. We have a commodity market. It really equates supply and demand. Yeah. There are speculators, but then speculators think that they have superior knowledge about the demand or supply side of any particular commodity and try to enter the market on that basis. On the other hand, the gamblers do not have any such specialized knowledge and their entry can cause certain disruptions. But the uh, real reading that we made was that the if you want to have a commodity exchange, and if you want that commodity exchange to have a certain depth and liquidity, if the farmers have to be able to go to the market at any time they like and keep their product on the market, then there has to be some kind of a depth and that depth can be provided only by the speculators and the gamblers. But they do not appear to have created any kind of an increase in price or a higher volatility in market. I think it's a very unpardonable thing yeah. that the finance minister has done in this budget. No, in fact, uh, we talk more about the farmers, but really not done something. For example, credit you mentioned. You know, it, the obsession of the government that credit alone can solve the problem itself is a cause of many problems. But taking about credit, like you mentioned, 52 percent of farmers do not get any credit from institutional lenders like banks. Is it not a failure of the banking system that we nationalized banking system way back in 69, almost 40 years ago, on the premise that this would universalize the banking? And now after 40 years, we are talking about in banking inclusiveness. So is it not a failure of the, you know, we use a lot of public money to nationalize banks. We are only now talking about rectifying those mistakes by way of bringing out capital adequacy norms, Basel 1, Basel 2 norms, bringing in Nursing Committee 1, Nursing Committee 2. But... Having done all that, even if you are not reached all the farmers in terms of giving credit, is it not a failure of our great exercise of national? The government report themselves show that the additional credit that the UPA brags about from 80,000 crores to about 160,000 crores has not reached the lower levels of the farm. Secondly, and something very important, that this increase of 80,000 crores is not reflected in the purchases of inputs made yeah. by the farmers. The important question is where did this credit go? And I think if we appoint some kind of a detective agency, then some very interesting facts will come out. Where does this money meant for cooperative societies go? 
and my opinion on the subject is that our agriculture ministry is more interested in protecting the cooperatives than protecting the farmers i think we'll come come back again on this because this is an important issue about the cooperatives but just we'll take a short break mm. don't go away we are talking to mr sharad joshi on a very interesting topic about how we can revive agriculture how we can make farmers life a better one please don't go away come back soon Welcome back to our program, Top Shot, in which we are talking to Mr. Sharad Joshi, Member of Parliament and a well-known farm leader who is actually trying to create an atmosphere of profitability and an atmosphere in which farmers can live decent life. So, Mr. Joshi, we are talking about uh, farmers and, you know, actually we are talking about farm sector, but not talking about farmers. Mm -hmm. We are talking about loan waiver for the bank, actually benefiting the banks rather than the farmers. So, should we not change the focus into farmers rather than everything else? If we do that, I think our policy framework will really fall in place. For example, there are farmers who don't want to continue farming. They are saying that we don't want to continue farming. So, if you go into the root cause of all this, then I think we'll really be able to find solution to the farming sector. My comment on the second point you raised, Suvesh, is very simply that most of the farmers of today are held captive because their forefathers bestowed land on them. They do not have any special aptitude or inclination for agriculture. And they do it by vote. My father did it, therefore I am doing yeah. it. One of the things that I had recommended when I drafted the agricultural policy yeah. for Mr. V.P. Singh yeah. was an exit policy for the farms. Yeah. And that becomes particularly necessary before or on the threshold of every revolution. On the threshold of the Green Revolution, we were lucky. We had the Ceiling Acts, we had the anti-tenancy legislation, we had the anti zamindari legislation. With the result that the forefathers of V.P. Narsiva, who was a 5,000 acre holder in Andhra Pradesh, got barely 30,000 rupees or so, but they took that money and came to the city. And then that money was used for educating the children and then the whole family came up much better off. One of the things that I have observed is that nobody loses by giving up agriculture. And for some time when they give up agriculture, not knowing what they will do, they might feel as if they are drowning. But when, if you want to learn swimming, I think getting into the water and letting and suffering some water in your nose and mouth is a part of the learning process. That is what all diaspora has to go through and that's what the farmers. Yeah. But ultimately, even those who were displaced by Senapati Bapat's vegetation, you will find they are all well off today. Yeah. That's right. Because they have come out of losing proposition into something into at least better. better. <laughs> if they will not lose at least. But, <coughs> you know, now you said uh, initial years of our independence, we actually try to create institutions like cooperatives. Mm. Today, cooperatives seems to be crumbling. Uh, the spirit of cooperation is gone. <coughs> Probably the institutions have remained some places. But that spirit of cooperatives suddenly evaporated. How do you create this again? Uh, how do you pump life into cooperatives? Not just putting capital, but the spirit of cooperative. How do you get it back? As a farmer, I have learned that a leaf is decayed. I just pluck off that leaf and throw it. Don't try to re-society. <coughs> the real reason why the cooperatives started failing was that this institution was promoted by the British. And when they promoted it, they had some give misgivings in the mind that if we create economic institutions that are based on the principle of one man, one vote, then they come very close to the political organization. And therefore, they deliberately created a very strong office of the Registrar of Cooperative Societies at various levels. He was given the final authority. And the cooperative bad bodies, as we see them in Scandinavia or Northern Europe, yeah. 
where they are autonomous yeah. and where they decide their own policies and their own future entirely has never come to India. In mm -hmm. India, cooperatives are really state bodies. Yeah. And you can see that... They are born the, in registrar's office rather registrar's than the minds of the people. Minds of the people. And you will see a good example of that in the sense that our constitution does not give people the fundamental right to form cooperatives. They can form associations. Yeah. That association includes unions, but the asso word association doesn't include cooperatives. That is why the government is now trying to make a massive amendment to the constitution, con amendment 106, and put a separate chapter for constitution in the constitution so that they will lay down from the Delhi government the essential outlines of the cooperative society. Another important thing about cooperatives is cooperatives have been admittedly failing all along. You remember that when D.R. Gadgil was appointed the chairman of the Google Credit yeah. Survey, the slogan he gave was cooperatives have failed, but cooperation must succeed. <laughs> and in many languages, Bina Sarkar Nahi Udda, yeah. that's the kind of poetry that goes on. The important question that farmers themselves never asked, or the leaders themselves never asked themselves was, why are we having this duality where all city people are supposed to form companies yeah. and all rural <laughs> people are supposed to form cooperatives? Why not give some chance to the farmers to try and form a cooperative society? The reason, the reason is the cooperative societies come very close to the political form of organization. The cooperative baron of today is seen as the MLA of tomorrow yeah. or member of parliament of tomorrow and is given a certain free hand. But the can consequences of this have been very disastrous. I would tell you that uh, normally if a farmer leader or a rural leader collects one crore of rupees, then the government gives him something like 99 crores to start a factory. He does nothing. He goes to standard contractors who give him the machinery. He uses only one technology which is called the open <laughs> pan technology with the result that the in entire Mahavatra cooperative sugar empire he has become the main producer of sugar. Well, all sugar factories the world over, sugar is a secondary product yes. and chemicals and other things produced out of that, not today, for example, ethanol. Yes, These are the main products. This is a very heavy price we are paying for the cooperative. But all the same, you will see that even in the last two years, something like 35,000 yes, crores yes. have been pumped into the cooperative, saying that we have to keep the cooperative alive. The important thing is, cooperatives can be kept alive only if the members remain alive. <laughs> or alternatively, I can say one thing. If you want to keep cooperatives alive, then they have to be sanitized. Yeah. The cooperative bank is a misnomer, is a contradiction in term. Cooperative banks, according to the basic universal principles of cooperation, cannot accept any deposits except from their own members. That's it. Because that's if, a mutuality, concept that's of mutuality. If they don't, if they start accepting deposits from outside and giving loans to outsiders, yeah. then they cease to be cooperative. That's it. But because so many leaders are involved in so many cooperative banks, this issue has not been brought out. Further, now one important factor since you started with rural credit is that despite the dislike and hatred of so many people, the private money lender has survived. He does not take any money, any subsidy from the government. He raises his own resources and goes on giving credit. And even then he gives something like 70 to 74 percent of the Google credit. So many people like your Aar Patil and Shavad Pawar have abused money lender mainly by caste considerations. But he continues to be there. And now we are trying to follow a 